Are you serious? Are you serious? Well, guys, I'm extremely serious, and we have got a great broadcast for you today. Timothy Alberino is going to join us today. He has just written a book called Birthright, which is fascinating. The coming post-human apocalypse. And the uh, literally, how Adam's dominion may have been taken up a notch, actually been observed by something. And maybe we don't really know the whole story. Matter of fact, Timothy really does challenge, uh, he will really challenge your biblical narrative as he not only tells us about pre-Adam, but during the process of mankind and then post-human apocalypse. This is an amazing book. I've got it right here. I started reading it last night because uh, I just got it. It showed up my door. I said, I got to start. And I started reading it and I was, I couldn't put it down. It's that good. It's extremely written. So we're glad to have him with us today. You can get his book at amazon.com. Timothy Alberino. How you doing, brother? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me on. It's great to have you. Great to see you again. You know, you're a fascinating individual. Uh, when I talked to you and met you and had lunch, uh, a couple years ago over there at the uh, Legends Conference. So, Timothy, okay, you want to tell us about a post-human apocalypse, but you don't start there, do you? Get us started with this book and, and what the, the message is you're getting across. You know, when I, when I began to write this book it's over two years ago, two and a half years ago, um, I, my, my original intention was to be more focused in on the question of transhumanism, post-humanism, and dealing with the end of the age and the things that are yet to unfold, the things that are even now beginning to unfold, um, but which are going to culminate um, in the future, culminate at Armageddon, actually. And uh, I realized that in order to tell this story, in order for people to understand posthumanism and why posthumanism is so critical to the events that are unfolding on the earth, I had to go all the way back to the beginning and and talk about, write about Adam, write about uh, the Garden of Eden, write about what it means to be a human being. Because if we're moving into a post-human paradigm, which we are, then we need to remind ourselves of what it means to be Adam. Because that's what being human means. Being a human being means being Adam. We are the, we are the sons and the daughters of Adam, the offspring of Adam. And we inherit, not only do we inherit Adam's genome, his likeness, we also inherit his birthright, which is dominion of the earth. That is the key point. You, and you have in this book, folks, he has a fascinating account of the birthright. Now, from Isaac who, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, when you, when you take a look at this, you make, a, you make a point that Sarah was barren and Ishmael was born, but he did not need or should not receive the birthright. It would have taken the bloodline from Adam to Christ. It would have messed it up. So you have Ishmael was standing in the way of Isaac. You have Esau standing in the way of Jacob. Uh, and, you know, you have uh, even Cain going way back, standing in the way of Abel. So what you do, and you, you, you're you saying that this was by design, that actually Lucifer had a plan to disrupt the bloodline of Christ. Is that right? Yes. Per the vision of the woman and the dragon in Revelation. Remember, John beh beholds a vision of this of this great red dragon and this woman who's with child and, and she's about to give birth and the dragon is poised to devour her offspring as soon as she gives birth. Well, that vision is an accurate depiction of the devil's strategy from the very beginning because he's been attempting this whole time to usurp the human birthright and also to destroy the line uh, that the Christ was destined to be born through which we found out later, later on in the story of human history that that was the line of Abraham. And so, you know, you have this, uh, this narrative throughout the scriptures, this reoccurring theme of the enemies of God, let's say, the enemies of God, and generally speaking, be they human or otherwise, attempting to, to destroy, to kill, to forestall, to foil the birth 
of the Christ, either by doing something very interesting in the wombs of, uh, of, of Sarah and then Rebecca with, uh, with Isaac and then Jacob, or uh, in the case of Moses with the Pharaoh deciding that he's going to kill all of, the, uh, all of the, uh, the infants among the Israelites, among the Hebrews. And then you have the same thing reoccurring, of course, in Jesus of Nazareth when he was b- born. Herod attempting to do the very same thing, to, 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 to stop the coming of this king, of this child king of Christ uh, by uh, murdering all of the, of the young boys uh, in the region of Bethlehem. So there's this, this constant attempt on the part of, of what I call the insurgency, the dragon and his insurgent forces, again, be they human or be they non-human, to stop the coming of Christ. And then, of course, Christ is born. Here it is the last attempt. Here it represents the last, the last attempt to do this. And by the way, here it it's very interesting. We don't have to go too deep into this, but but I, I do in the book. Herod, people don't realize that Herod was an illegitimate ruler. Uh, King Herod was an Edomite. He was he was not uh, of the he was not uh, from one of the tribes of of Israel. He was an Edomite. In fact, he came from uh, the people who were historically the arch enemies of Israel. And uh, he was he was from Edom, from the land of Edom, which means red, which there's a correlation between Edom, red and the red dragon that we see in Revelation, who's attempting to devour uh, this 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 man child, this male child before he's born. And of course, we know what happens that 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 the, the what I call the dragon slayer prophecy, which is the some people refer to it as the seed war that began in the in Genesis three. I'm sure your audience is very familiar with this, where Jesus or um, I'm sorry, the maker um that that the creator god himself pronounces a judgment prophesies to the serpent that you know paraphrasing that that one day there's going to be a a son of adam born from the virgin womb of a daughter of eve and that and that this person this human being this son of adam would crush his head essentially that there was a dragon slayer coming through the womb of a daughter of Eve, through the virgin womb of a daughter of Eve. And so uh, we can see the dragon from uh, from Revelation to uh, from from Genesis to Revelation attempting to foil the dragon slayer prophecy for the first for the first few thousand years, actually much more than a few thousand years, leading all the way up to the birth of Christ. And when Christ is born, crucified, and then rises from the dead in the sense of the right hand of the Father, there's nothing more that the dragon t- can do to, to forestall the prophecy. Christ has been born, the dragon slayer has come into the world and is now seated at the right hand of the Father, waiting to return. And so the only thing left for the dragon to do is to prepare for war. It's the, it's the only thing left that he can do. It's the only option that's left for him at this point is to is to lead the nations into open war. I call it kinetic war, kinetic war with the kingdom of heaven to resist the return of the dragon slayer, Jesus Christ at the end of the age. And this is exactly what Armageddon is. Armageddon is not a battle of of Israel and its enemies. It's much grander than that. Armageddon is a battle uh, of the dragon and his alliance, his coalition, uh, including the beast, who I think is his progeny, who are resisting the return of Christ, who is coming with the armies of heaven. So it's this cosmic battle that culminates, that began long before Adam was created, in my opinion, and culminates at Armageddon. So it's, it, you know, it's an epic. The, the, the gospel of Christ is an epic. It's the first epics. It's the original epic, the original grand narrative that was ever told uh to the human species tremendous information folks timothy alberino with us today his book birthright get it at amazon.com check out his website also at timothyalvarino.com uh wow uh, let me just read to you a little a portion here of his book he says on page 161 he says enoch's testimony concerning the fate of the nephilim is verified in the new testament the unclean spirits that had proceeded from the offspring of the watchers were permitted to freely wander the earth and 
afflict mankind without incurring judgment until the end of the age, at which time the great judge would appear to cast them with their fathers into the lake burning with fire and brimstone. It is for this reason that the demons despaired when they saw Jesus of Nazareth walking on the shores of Galilee and shrieked, What have we to do with you, Jesus, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before our time? A similar episode occurs in a synagogue in Capernaum. And he goes on to say, You can imagine their shock. What was the king of heaven doing on earth before the appointed time of judgment? Even the disembodied Nephilim, whose fathers were formerly numbered among the princes of kingdom, had not an anticipated God's plan to redeem mankind through the blood of his beloved son. You, you're, you're building the paradigm here that this battle is ancient, and it's it's before Adam, it's before Christ, it's it's coming down, as you say, to the battle of Armageddon, the final battle, Revelation 19. But in the, on the process, you st I remember reading somewhere in the book where you talk about Adam was incredible, that he was like almost like Superman. Uh, is that correct? Yes. Um, from my perspective, and I spend a great deal of time in the begin beginning of the book unfolding this this paradigm this this perspective of mine that adam was adam was not created and then given a purpose adam was created for a purpose and as i always say those are two distinct concepts so there was a reason why god decided to create adam and when god created adam he did so uh, in such a way that he that he endowed him okay hang on a second folks we lost we lost him just for one second here we, go. we lost him we lost him his, his physical strength um, and and he also endowed him with the authority to execute his his purpose on earth and, and and in this and in this way, uh, Adam was fully equipped to do exactly what God had created him to do, which was to govern the earth. Adam was created to be a regent of planet Earth, and not only was Adam a regent of planet Earth, um, in that capacity, he was also created to be a son of God. So Adam was created for fellowship with the father in the father's house and he was given regency of the earth he was given dominion of planet earth and that dominion contrary to popular conception that dominion has never been rescinded it's never been rescinded the dominion of adam now it has been usurped it was usurped one time in the pre-flood world and uh, that has to do with the watchers and, and their hybrid offspring and it will be usurped again at the end of the age but it was never rescinded and the reason why uh i emphasize this is because a lot of people are under the impression that adam somehow lost his dominion his mandate of dominion his authority uh, after he fell that is not the case in fact the bible makes it explicitly clear that that's not the case in the book of psalms we're told that the heavens even the heavens are the lord's heavens but the earth he has given to the sons of men and who are the sons of men they're the offspring of adam the birthright of adam which is dominion of the earth is inherited through adam's likeness through his genome we all bear the genome of Adam. We all bear the likeness of Adam and in turn the likeness of God. And it is the, the likeness in which we are created is the seal of our authority on earth. And so from my perspective, and I believe the, and, and, I, and I use a lot of scriptures to, to, to buttress my perspective, uh, mankind was originally created, Adam was originally created to be a, a member of the household of God, a sibling in the family of God to have fellowship with the father. That's what he did. He walked in the cool of the day with the maker, fellowship with the father and also with his other older sibling, which is another thing altogether. And then to govern the earth as the regent of 
this planet and he was equipped adam was equipped as i said with all of the biological proficiencies to accomplish his purpose on earth and so adam was magnificent he was uh he was the apex of of humanity um adam was the prototypical human being he probably was uh, possessed um he probably was able to do things that that today we would ascribe and do ascribe to some of our superhero uh comic book characters i think that adam had hyper perception i think he could i think that adam could perceive and i make a case for this in my book perceive the dimensional totality of created order in other words he could perceive dimensions that are uh, that are are uh, are imperceivable to us today because as paul says we uh the offspring of adam because we've degenerated from adam uh, because Adam was expelled, he was exiled from from Eden, and as a result, um, his offspring are in a process of continual degeneration, genetic degeneration, and therefore we have this perceptual impairment, which I liken to cataracts because Paul likens it to cataracts. Paul says that we see in part, we prophesy in part that that now we see as through a dim or as as through a mirror dimly, and the the um, uh, the cataracts when you have cataracts in your eyes the impairment of cataracts is precisely that it's seeing through a film a cloudy film and when people who get cataracts removed if you've ever seen their expressions on their faces um, when those cataracts are removed suddenly you have all these colors and light and the clarity of what's around you becomes exceedingly defined and 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 people uh react with great enthusiasm and surprise when they have their cataracts removed and so I think that we're going to realize at the resurrection, because that's when we have our cataracts removed. And by the way, the resurrection restores us to the blueprint of Adam. We don't become something other than human. Indeed, we become more human than we are today because all of us are degenerate copies, mutant copies of Adam. So the resurrection restores us. It repairs our genome. It resets us to the blueprint of Adam. And when that happens, our cataracts, the scales on our eyes, as the Bible refers to them, will fall off. And we're going to be able to perceive the dimensional totality of created order, as did our father, Adam. Remember that that uh, the, the New Testament teaches us that. Uh, that that at the that after the resurrection we will see him as he is referring to Jesus and we will be seen by him and so um, uh, we have a, a tremendous hope in Christ that what was lost in Adam is regained in Christ at the resurrection for the believer Timothy Alvarino, folks. Timothy Alvarino, uh, go to his website at timothyalvarino.com. If you want to get his book, go to Amazon. Birthright, a post-human apocalypse. And uh, you're talking about the, the uh, genome. I was reading uh, 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 this morning the post-human paradigm. Uh, you begin to write in Chapter 12 that President Bill Clinton actually in June of 2004 stood in the East Room of the White House and began to tell everybody about a time 200 years prior to that uh, or so that uh, uh, that uh, the President of the United States then uh, walked in there, Thomas Jefferson, and he had a map that was delivered to him by Lewis and Clark and their great ex expedition, their exploration of uh, the West and how he, he Clinton went on to say, today the world is joining us here in the East Room to behold a map of even greater significance. We are here to celebrate the completion of the first survey of the entire human genome. Without a doubt, this is the most important, most wondrous map ever produced by humankind. The most wondrous map to which the president referred to was the sequence the genome of the human species, the blueprint of Adam's genetic architect, and more than a decade of intensive effort involving an international consortium of 20 institutions employing hundreds of geneticists from around the world. The Human Genome Project was finally consummated, and President's comparison to the remarkable achievements of the bold expedition of Lewis and Clark are perhaps more realized than ever in this and listen timothy alvarino's book birthright the reason you say this is important 
is, and I'm taking it and, and without f completely reading the book at the end, uh, I assume is because if Satan failed, if Lucifer failed to destroy the bloodline of Jesus Christ, which he tried very hard to do, when he couldn't, he tried to corrupt it. He, you know, even Mo, even uh, Noah said, look, God said, look, all the flesh is corrupted, you know, uh, even the flesh of beast. But he started over with the with the flood. If he couldn't corrupt it and he couldn't destroy it. And if the and if the uh, and if he couldn't eliminate the birthright, if he couldn't slaughter the, the deliverer, whether it be Moses or be Jesus Christ. Now, what's he going to do? Well, it seems like he is trying to genetically alter us in some way to prevent our ability to uh, be connected with our Heavenly Father and maybe even to stop us and prevent us from being resurrected in this new man, this new creation, this new Adam that you speak of uh, in the likeness of Christ. Is Are you going there? And can you expound on that a little bit, Timothy? The... As you said, we, we in, in, in the year 2000, at the consummation of the Human Genome Project, we officially began our march towards post-humanism because that's the beginning of the hybrid age, uh, the genetic revolution. We're now, we're now 20 years into the genetic revolution and much has been occurring behind the scenes and I document that in my book. Um, in the United States, but especially in other places like China. And so we are headed towards, uh, we are inevitably headed towards a post-human paradigm. What I mean by post-human paradigm is a point in time on planet Earth in which the majority of Earth's inhabitants will no longer be human beings in the likeness of Adam. They will be uh, evolved, so to speak, out of Adam. They will become humanity 2.0, the Ubermensch, the Ubermenschen that uh, Nietzsche talks about, the, the superhumans of the future, uh, the Homo Deus, the God man uh, that uh, technologists are today writing about. Uh, and so we have to understand the, uh, the apocalyptic implications that are associated with mankind evolving himself out of Adam. Because who has dominion of the earth? Adam has dominion of the earth. And so what happens when the offspring of Adam are no longer human enough to claim or appropriate the authority of Adam? Uh, and by the way, I spend a, a lot of time in the book explaining this principle of dominion and, and, and of Adam's authority, the authority of the human race on planet Earth, uh, especially as it relates to the, uh, the enforcement of our authority, because you can have all the authority in the world, but if you don't have anyone to enforce your authority, then your authority is irrelevant. And so God gave Adam dominion of the earth and his offspring inherit his birthright, a, which is dominion of the earth, the title deed of the earth, so to speak, uh, which was never rescinded. Remember that the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And Adam was endowed. He was, he was bequeathed with uh, his authority on earth, with dominion of the earth, with the deed of the earth. He, it was given to him and to his offspring. And so the question then becomes, who, who enforces Adam's dominion? Uh, again, if, if there's no one to enforce someone's dominion, then there's nothing stopping uh, the enemies of Adam, for example, uh, from taking over. And when I say the enemies of Adam, I'm referring to non-humans from showing up and taking possession of the earth. Because we all know, as Christians, we all believe, whether we know it or not, we all believe in non-human sentient entities that are operating in the cosmos. And we refer to them as angels, or some people refer to them, the, the, the defected faction, as fallen angels. But, but I think we can all agree that humans are not the only players in the game. And we're not, the, we're, not the, we're not the best, and we're not the brightest, and we're not the strongest. So how is it that we retain dominion on Earth? Because we do. 
if we did not retain dominion on earth, we would not have human beings ruling from human thrones. We would not have human uh, prime ministers and presidents and kings and princes and so on. We would have other kinds of creatures occupying those thrones and ruling over us. Uh, we would have we would have the dragon and his and his. Uh, his subordinate princes ruling over the nations, openly ruling over the nations. The reason why they don't is because they can't. The reason why they can't is because the armies of heaven enforce our dominion on earth. And this is clear in the scriptures, by the way. So the dominion of mankind is enforced by the hosts of heaven. Host is a martial term. It means armies. The armies of heaven enforce our dominion on earth. And so as long as man remains human, he retains dominion of the earth. So post-humanism is a satanic ploy to get us to sell our birthright, so to speak, for a bowl of stew. And, and that is the promise of immortality. The, the bowl of stew is the promise of immortality. It's life extension. It's... it's uh, these uh, superhuman capabilities that transhumanism is, uh, is going to make available to those who uh, get the upgrades. And uh, ultimately, what's going to happen is we are going to uh, forfeit the image of Adam, which is the seal of our authority on Earth, and we are going to lose dominion on planet Earth at the end of the age. And somebody else is going to usurp it. And I believe that... that uh, because remember, in, the, in Revelation, at the end of the age, there's ten kings, and then there's a there's a principal king who's ruling over them, uh, a great and terrible prince, who is the, the this person we call the Antichrist, who the Bible designates as the Beast, who's ruling over this dystopian empire at the end of the age. I believe that that person, the Beast, the Antichrist, is going to be a hybrid is going to be the, the hybrid offspring of the dragon and a human woman. And the reason for that is because he is going to inherit the birthright of Adam when the human species is collectively uh, disinheriting the birthright of Adam and becoming less human and forfeiting their dominion on earth. So at the end of the age, uh, the, the beast is given, he's permitted to rule for at least three and a half years, permitted to rule, why? Because he does so legally. And at the end of the age, um, there will scarcely be a human being left on planet Earth. I believe most of the populace will be at that point post-human. We will lose our birthright. And this is why uh, post-humanism is what I call, it's, it's a pitfall. It's, it's, it's the pitfall of post-humanism and the, the machination of the dragon is to, uh, is to entice us to sell our birthright. Again, dominion of the earth for a bowl of stew at the end of the age. And this may sound confusing to people and complicated. It is complicated, I can assure you. But that's why I spend so much time and effort uh, trying to unfold it carefully, unfold it with all kinds of uh, scripture references uh, to make my point. Timothy Alvarino, folks, what a, what a, well, first of all, he's a fascinating guy. Uh, tremendous work he's done. He's traveled the world. Uh, some would say he's almost like the new in, uh, modern day Indiana Jones. And this book is amazing. Birthright. Get a copy of it at Amazon. I, I highly recommend it. Now, I mean, I am infatuated with now finishing reading this book after getting started. I just wanted to find out a little bit about what it was about. I didn't have a clue that I, how well it was written, how well it was documented, how well it was researched and thought through. Extraordinary. To bring us to a, 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 cl a more clear paradigm understanding is what uh, Timothy Alberino does. He challenges maybe your very thought of these times. Uh, we really appreciate you being, being with us today. Uh, really do. And uh, we love the work you do. We want you to keep up and keep writing and uh, keep exploring and keep us up to date what's going to happen in this world that we're in. Well, I really appreciate it. And uh, I want to just mention also, you know, I talk about the watchers in this book. I talk about the Genesis 6 affair, but I also talk about aliens. Uh, I talk about uh, the, 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 the alien presence, and I do so in a way that people are probably uh, unfamiliar with. And I have a very different take on uh, the alien question, especially as it pertains to the gray aliens. And so there's a lot here. 
and uh, really, uh, I'm 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 getting all kinds of uh, really good feedback. I think uh, um, I've I've laid out a position here that is perhaps in some ways unorthodox, but in other ways. It, it, it highlights and it and it places exclamation points on some of the um, on some of the concepts that people are already familiar with. So I really encourage people to to get the book and to and to explore these topics from from a different perspective. Timothy, thank you so much for being with us. And this was a great, great, uh, great book you've written. I really have to say, folks, I put a put a big uh, check mark of yes, a must read. We'll talk to you again, Timothy. Thank you, so much, Thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you with us today. Folks, I'll be back with more information right here on the coming apocalypse. Yeah. Uh, Timmy